Hi. Uh, how are you guys doing today? I can't see you at all. It's just a black abyss, but I assume there's many people out there. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Deno. It's a project I've been working on for the last year uh, with some other people. And um, yeah, before I talk about it, I have to give a disclaimer because I think there's a lot of people in the room here who use Node and maybe use it professionally. And Deno is a project that is very similar to Node. And I don't want to worry you like, uh, Deno is very experimental. It's not ready for production. Um, it's not going to be ready for production anytime soon. So don't worry about it. Keep using Node. Node, Node is managed by a lot of very smart people and it's very stable. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good piece of software that you should use. But that said, um, Deno is, is a new command line. You, uh, runtime um, and it executes JavaScript and TypeScript and it's built on top of V8 and Rust and Tokyo. How many people know Tokyo? No one. Great. How many people are Rust programmers? Oh, oh, oh one. Okay. Well, you guys should check out Rust. It's, it's, it's very nice. Um, and also Tokyo at some point. Um, but, and also TypeScript, the TypeScript compiler itself. <clears throat> and so, of course, the, the main question is, is why would you do this? What, what's, what's the point? Isn't this disrupting the community? Isn't this bifurcating the, the module systems? Like, uh, nothing good can come from this. Isn't this a, a Python 3 situation? Uh, where you know we we we're going to end up with ten years of of uh, difficulty with 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 kind of two different uh, forks of of the language, um, and I think those are those are good concerns. But I, I think it's it's time to reevaluate uh, JavaScript and and Node. Um, in particular, JavaScript has changed quite a bit um, in the last uh, 10 years since, since I originally sat down to, to do Node. Um, and yeah, the, I'm, the, the main important features that, that have been added are, are uh, typed arrays, which give you like true access to binary data. That was not around in 2009. And ES modules, right? The, the, the module system has, is now standardized, and we don't need to, uh, I mean, the, the whole require thing was, was just invented, right? Um, and not very well. And so this, we have this, this nice uh, way of importing modules. Um, and of course, the, the whole promise is async await stuff is, is uh, a really important feature for, for asynchronous I.O. Um, and makes it really interesting to, to do in JavaScript. Um, and Node has its problems. Uh, you know, it's, it's 10 years old, so it's, you know, it has kind of a, uh, a lot of legacy APIs that aren't uh, uh, promise aware, I would say, or, or you know, just, just are kind of showing their age at this point. And, the, the module system in particular is, is a pain point. Uh, you know, you, you have this, this node modules folder and all, all of your, your local modules get installed there. <coughs> um, the module resolution algorithm for, for kind of how you, how you look up those things is, is quite complicated. It's like, you know, if, if you're requiring foo, you start walking up the directory tree towards the root, looking for a node modules path, and then walk into that node modules path and, and, and try to resolve the module, plus a lot of other things, right? It, it like interprets package.json, and it's just a, a very complicated resolution scheme. And uh, in, in general, in, the, in Node, people are using the NPM databases for storing the modules, which um, is great because it works. Uh, but it's not very webby. Uh, the web is, is meant to be a bit more decentralized, right? 
Um, and of course, there's this whole issue of security, right? So, so V8, the, the big piece of software on which, which makes Node and Deno possible, um, is, is a secure sandbox, right? It, you, you have the ability to, to execute code and not have it, uh, have the ability to, to do nefarious things in your, in your system. Uh, unfortunately, in Node, we kind of poked holes everywhere in, in the system, and you know you can you can open up EDC password without a problem, um, which is a bit unfortunate because because we've kind of uh, left the didn't use V8 to its to its full capacity, um, and yeah, these are these are not. Problems that are unique to Node. These are these are problems that Python and, and Ruby similarly suffer from. Um, yeah, and I, I would just say that that you know in in my kind of day to day life, I'm programming mostly in compiled languages like C plus plus and Rust and Go, and the types of problems that I'm after are are generally in that realm. Uh, and I think some people might argue that kind of the, the, the era of dynamic languages is over. Uh, that, that uh, well, it's, it's hard to argue that to a, to a JavaScript conference. You guys are probably still very much on the, the dynamic language bandwagon. Uh, but I, there's, there's people out there that are arguing that like, you know, Rust is so good that maybe we can write everything in Rust. Go is so good that we can write everything in Go. That's much more imaginable to me. Rust is super painful, very, very difficult, right? Writing something in C++, very painful, very slow. Writing stuff in Go, very fast, actually quite, quite nice. Um, but all of those don't compare to writing a bit of JavaScript, right? If, if, you, if you know it quite well, then you can move very fast, right? You can, can hack things together and prototype in a very efficient way. Uh, or you know, if you know Python or, or Ruby, but whatever your, your dynamic language of choice, these are great tools for moving very quick. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, although I don't generally use dynamic languages for the things that I'm making, I end up writing a lot of dynamic code as kind of uh, tooling around, around the project. You know, maybe you're cleaning some data, maybe you're rename, renaming a bunch of files, maybe you, need, you have a build system that you need to do some random tasks with. You're not going to like do this in Rust. You, you, you really want to have a dynamic language for that. So I just think that uh, having a good scripting platform is really important. And I don't think that any of the tools out there today are uh, satisfactory. And I, I just think it can be better. And it's an important enough problem to try to address. So let me tell you about Deno. Um, <clears throat> So it's, it's a single executable file. Um, it's not a tarball. It doesn't come with a bunch of header files. Uh, and I, I, I would make the promise that, that it's always going to be distributed this way. Um, yeah, we, 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 we want to, it's, I think the, the executable on, on OS X is about 50 megabytes. And yeah, we're, we're going to strive to kind of keep it this nice and compact file that uh, you can easily install in different places. You know, maybe, maybe this, is, this is meant to be kind of a, uh, kind of a, a Swiss army knife of, of, of tooling, right? You're, you're, I, I want to break this out in all of the random cases where I need, to, I need a little bit of dynamic language programming. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if it's on a CI server and I need to, you know, uh, format some files to check that uh, they're uh, formatted correctly, you know, Deno is easily installable with a single command and whatnot. Um, we ship on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And yeah, the, the, this executable is 
supposed to be all you will ever need to run a deno program. So, so it's just kind of, you know, this little thing that you can use. Um, <clears throat> in deno, you don't require modules. We have ES modules. And when you import things, you use URLs to import them. So this is very, this is, this is actually how ES modules work in the browser. Have you, have you tried this? Have you tried to import URLs in, in a web browser? Like this, this, this works. Um, so I think this basically solves the, the module situation, right? Versioning can be done within a URL. This kind of solves the, the centralization problem too, because of course the, the, the server can be specif is specified in the URL. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and the, there's, it's, it's just incredibly simple. There's, there's nothing surprising about what it does. There's no node modules, there's no index.js. Um, <clears throat> Deno knows how to fetch and cache and compile code. Uh, and you don't really have to worry about that. That's, it's all kind of stored in a hidden f folder somewhere. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, I, I, you might be wondering like, you know, Often I'm flying, often I don't have internet access. How's this supposed to work? I don't want my program to always have to connect to the internet in order to execute something. And the, this, can, this can work, right? Uh, it, it caches things in, in kind of a, it has a, a certain behavior to the, to the caching in that it never deletes the cache until you, you require, you uh, reload it. I'll demonstrate that. Um, and bare imports, do you know what bare imports are? No one. When you just require foo, that's a bare import. That is like not a URL, kind of what you're used to. Um, there's a emerging standard called import maps that uh, we're going to support in, in Deno. So you'll be able to import from foo. Um, yeah, and we're trying to be browser compatible with this. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of places where uh, Deno overlaps with, with, uh, with what the web browser does. So for example, like if you're going to make an HTTP request, we have the fetch method and we don't, we try not to deviate from, from the standard. Um, you know, for starting a new thread in Deno, you, you use web workers, the, like the exact web worker API. Um, so, you know, where, where possible, we're, we're, we're trying to use these, these browser APIs. Um, yeah, so here's, here's some of the, the things that are, are in there, which, yeah, it's actually not that much. Um, and of course, there's, there's many things that Deno does that browsers don't do, right? So like, creating a TCP connection. Uh, those, those don't have a corresponding browser API. And in that case, we, we kind of invent our own. Um, so it has TypeScript out of the box. It's, it's built in. Uh, and we use v, a feature called V8 Snapshots. It's a, it's a, a way of um, basically preloading your program and looking at the the heap and kind of taking a snapshot of that. We can, we can basically load up the TypeScript compiler ahead of time during our compilation process and uh, kind of look at the heap, write it to a file, and then embed that file into our executable. And so when we go to start, when, when you use Deno to compile some TypeScript code, you don't need to first compile the compiler. Um, it, it can start up very very quickly using this feature. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're I like TypeScript. I think it's it's a great way of you know organizing mature mature code. Uh, but you know JavaScript also works, right? It's it's V8, so we we can just dump JavaScript directly into into the VM um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of the dream, right? This is this is the optional typing dream. So you know, you 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 start your project and you're you're prototyping and you want to move really fast, and so you're you just open up a editor and you start typing some JavaScript and it goes very quickly. 
And you know, usually you throw that code away because uh, you know the project goes nowhere. You you do something else. Um, but you know, in in the rare off chance that this code actually turns into something that you know turns into a business or whatever, you you want to start making this this code more mature. So you you start adding types. You want to have more tests. You know, you 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 kind of uh, uh, just you know generally improve the quality of the code. And I mean, what, what's great about TypeScript is that it's it's just JavaScript with with types added. So you know, I'm hoping with with Deno with with uh, TypeScript built in that we can kind of have this very smooth transition without having to install extra things. You know, add something to your build system, whatnot. And you know, the, I think the the final step beyond TypeScript is that you know you're running your program and you realize like, oh, I'm there's there's some hot code in here. Uh, you know, there's there's a really hot loop in here. This this is actually not appropriate for a dynamic language. Uh, you know, how then how how do you move that bit of code out out of out of TypeScript and and into something that's that's faster, Rust in particular. Um, so I I mean that that last transition is is not well fleshed out yet, but to to some degree we we can do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, this this is kind of generally how I would want my workflow to to be. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, when I, when JavaScript is used, I, I would just say that it doesn't pass through the TypeScript compiler. So you, I mean, you you basically get a, a fairly uh, optimal uh, experience when when you're using just raw raw TypeScript. So the startup time is quite fast and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, the 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 demo runtime is is written in TypeScript, and so we we can kind of provide a full uh, uh, explanation of all the types in in there. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm breathing into this thing really heavily. Um, yeah, and there's and and the standard modules, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Are uh, in TypeScript too, so you you know you get all the nice experiences with with uh, with VS Code if 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 you use that. And I, I put a link to a to a module that allows you to kind of use use VS Code without too much pain points. Um, and I mentioned security before, so uh, the idea is like when you run this thing, when you run a program without any arguments, it's uh, secure by default. So, so things run in a sandbox. So by default, uh, programs can't access the disk. They can't access the network. Um, and to, to allow that access, uh, you have to, to give these command line flags. So for example, I've, I've put uh, allow read equals temp. This is, allows you to read from only the temp subtree. Or allow e or allow net equals Google, only allowing you to to access the the Google domain name. <coughs> um, <coughs> so, yeah, I mean, part of uh, you know having having a having a productive environment is having a set of standard modules that are high quality and that you can access and. In Node, we kind of have this problem where the the standard library is is very small, which is kind of a nice design choice, trying to keep keep things simple. But by pushing everything into into the into the third party ecosystem into into npm, you you kind of have this proliferation of like very small modules. Nobody knows what's the standard way of of doing anything. There's just like many many ways of of doing everything. And so you, you end up getting these these really crazy dependency trees, um, and so my hope with with kind of defining a larger standard module set that is that we can uh, avoid this this problem because you know if everybody ultimately links back to the the standard modules, then kind of this dependency tree that goes off in every di direction terminates really relatively quickly because every everything kind of would terminate at this. Uh, in the in the standard modules, uh, yeah. I, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, these these are under development. Uh, I put some links here to to a couple of the modules. Um, 
these things are audited in, in that, like, I review all the code or Bert reviews all the code. Um, these, this is not just kind of a, a free-for-all on, 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 on GitHub. Um, and these things don't have any external dependencies. So, you know, you can, you can kind of include these things with, with some reasonable sanity. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, it's, it's generally organized after Go's standard module system, which I think is really well done and really well thought about. Um, we we kind of want to avoid inventing APIs, because that takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, and this has been done many times before. And Go's, Go's done a very good job at, at it. So, uh, you know, generally when, when somebody's trying to include some new code into this, into Deno standard, uh, you know, we, I, I would ask, where's, where's the, the equivalent bit of code in, in Go's standard library? And can we take their documentation? Can we copy their interface? Can we copy their tests? This, this kind of just allows us a uh, bit of like intellectual scaffolding to, to design this the standard library. <coughs> and yeah, the, 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 it's versioned with Deno. Uh, so you, you, you know, you can link to at uh, v06 and know that it, it will work with, with Deno 0 0.6. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll get into some demos in a second, but I thought I'd just give a bit of an overview. Um, <clears throat> so native bindings, this, this is kind of a, a core design. This is actually the, how Deno started, was um, thinking about how, how Node built all the bindings to all the various things that Node does, right? Node, Node has, has bindings to all sorts of uh, system functionality. <clears throat> And it's kind of like all over the place, right? There's, 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 uh, it's, it's kind of a lot of, of code. Um, and ultimately, uh, kind of at the event loop layer, like, Node doesn't really care about how things are being bound together. It's, it's more caring about, you know, notifications and handling data and moving data around. Um, so I, I think a, a very nice way to organize such a VM is to make all of the, the bindings uh, done through message passing. So essentially, uh, you, you can allocate some, some UN8 array in, in JavaScript and send a pointer to that, send a not, not a copy of it, but, but a pointer to it into Rust, where you can do some uh, Rust stuff, some some system stuff, and uh, kind of get get a call back in, into JavaScript with with uh, another another uh, UN8 array or or with nothing, um, and you know generally you can just kind of serialize any sort of operation that you want to do in, into this, and so this this makes it a really simple. Uh, makes it nice kind of at the lower la layers of Deno for organizing things. Uh, so we, we, we don't expose uh, like the V8 uh, API to, to, to embedders, to, uh, to people who are, who are writing bindings, right? If you want to write a binding to say file system events, uh, you, 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 you can't access raw, raw V8 handles. You can't like create a global. That needs to be done in JavaScript code. And then somehow wh whatever you're trying to do serialized into a buffer and sent over to, uh, to the Rust side. <coughs> and oops. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, that this, is, this is actually very uh, performant in, in ways because it, it can be handled all very uniformly. Um, so native bindings are actually promises. Um, so it, this is kind of the, a big part of, of what Deno provides is, is that it's essentially a way of connecting promises in uh, JavaScript to futures in Rust. Um, and yeah, I, I, the, it, 
there, there are ways to, to make a synchronous call into Rust. Um, but I mean, gen generally, it's, it's, uh, it's always resulting in a, in a promise. So, so it kind of has this, this very uh, sim simple, all, all of the native bindings are very similarly organized. Uh, and I, I think that that makes it easier to, to maintain. Yeah, and uh, of course, like in, in Rust, there, Rust is, is growing very rapidly and, and has a lot of asynchronous modules. And so we want to be able to take advantage of those things. Um, so another feature I, I should mention is uh, that Deno has a Rust crate. And well, I just realized there's only one Rust programmer here, so <laughs> for for that guy, um, uh, there's there's this crate, um, and you know this is a, a very particular use case. But um, you know if 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 you have this use case, I, I think this is really interesting. Uh, you know sometimes you're making a database, and you want to be able to execute a bit of JavaScript, right? You want to implement a MapReduce uh, functionality for your users. Um, like, what, how, how are you going to do that? Are you going to embed V8? Are you going to, uh, you know, try, try to do that yourself? Uh, in general, you're probably not going to do that in the right way. Like, we, we've thought very hard about how to design this, this interface with, with between V8 and, and Rust. So, um, you know, your other option is, is you can, like, shell out to node, you could shell out to deno even, but I mean, that's, that's quite uh, heavy lifting. Uh, that's something if I was designing a database, I, I would not want to do. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think that there's, there's kind of this, this interesting use case of, of embedding uh, the, the, the runtime inside of other programs, uh, something that, that Node can't do, or at least can't do very easily. Um, yeah, so, well, with that elongated overview, let me just jump into a terminal here while I breathe heavily in this thing. Okay. Uh, you can see that. So, Deno is a program, and if you just type it with nothing else, you, you get uh, a, a REPL, like you do with Node, and you can execute some JavaScript there. Um, so, yeah, we, we, have, we don't have the global object, we have the window object, and like I showed you before, the, the, here's kind of the global things inside of Deno. There's this capital Deno object, this is, where all of the, the fun functionality is, is held. So uh, looking in there, you see a bunch of stuff like args, PID, exit. You know, let's, let's just try one of these. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've, I always have, oh. I always have problems with uh, microphones. Uh, what was I doing? Oh yeah, deno.exit. Sure, exits the program, right? Um, deno.metrics is kind of something interesting. Uh, actually, there's a better way to display this. So it, it returns an object with you know some some random values in here. Uh, if you do console table, you can kind of see this in a better way. Um, so it has this like ops dispatched and ops completed. Uh, you know, as I was mentioning this this uh, this this binding API earlier, where promises are kind of turned into futures and and vice versa. Um, if uh, so, the, uh, these things are called ops, and you know we we can kind of uh, inspect these things relatively easily. Uh, and, and we kind of have these, these kind of centralized ways of tracking this, right? So, so if you see that there's, there's apparently two ops being done in between these, these two uh, the, to do this console table. I think one of them is to actually get the metrics and the other is, is probably to interface with the, 
with the uh, read eval print loop. Um, yeah, so oops. if we do deno help, we have all these uh, subcommands here, which are like eval and fetch and format and info. Um, I just wanted to show you some of these just to give you an idea of what this looks like. So, well, let me show you deno types. So I, I mentioned that deno uh, uses TypeScript and that the, the, the whole runtime is, is, uh, is built in TypeScript. And so kind of an artifact of that is that we can give you a, a uh, TypeScript declaration file that defines the complete runtime, what, exactly what, what's in this thing. So when I, print, when I do this, like, prints out this, this huge file, right? Uh, which I will now pipe into Vim. And I will set the file type to TypeScript. Yeah, so you see there's, there's this namespace deno with like deno.pid, no color, exec path, is TTY. So all, all, the, all the functionality is, is, is very uh, accurately defined in, in, in this file, which is, is a really nice thing to have, right? Uh, one of the benefits of TypeScript. We, we, we can't really do this with, with Node. Uh, oops. So, you know, I, I mentioned that this is like a kind of a little command line utility that, that I'm hoping that, you know, just kind of solves all of my dynamic language needs. Uh, and so, you know, one, one of these needs is, is that you're, you're you're kind of on the command line. You just want to hack around with some stuff. You have a file. You need to munge it in a certain way. You kind of have to do like line-based processing. Um, so deno eval just evals stuff, right? So if I do like console log one two three, it logs that, right? But what is deno x eval? Uh, deno x eval is kind of like X args, X args. Does that mean anything to anybody? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, so, so it executes a script for every line of of standard in, right? So, so let's do this. Let's cat EDC password, right? Which is this big file. And yeah, let's. So, the kind of the last bit of of the of the EDC password is, is uh, the shell that it executes, this, this user bin false, right? Let's, why don't we try to like grep this? So let's, let's basically do this command. So I'm, I'm going to grep the, the EDC password for false, right? So how would you do that with X eval? So you'd be, so the, the current uh, line is dollar sign. So, for example, if I if I do like uh, if dollar sign includes uh, false, then console log dollar sign. No, oh. oh, I guess I messed that up. Okay, log. Okay, right. So. So this is just this is basically you know a really long way to write grep, but what's what's nice about this is that it's JavaScript of course, so so we can do a bit more. So why don't we you know these 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 lines are kind of uh, colon delimited, right? There's all these various fields in here. Why don't we try to pull out the first field here? So we'll we'll split on the colon and grab the first field. So so if it includes false. Then let's do console. Let's log the one, the first thing. So console log uh, dollar sign split colon right, and then like the first element right. So 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 th this is kind of uh, you know your uh, a better awk or uh, maybe maybe not better uh, a more verbose awk. Uh, so. It, you know, the, I, I, I guess I, I just show this as an example of, of kind of 
tooling that that comes with this that I, I think you know kind of helps you in in your day to day stuff, um, in your day to day programming. Um, so yeah, I'm, let me show some actual code here. Um, so uh, the canonical example for 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 Node was always a HTTP server, and, and Deno has a HTTP server too. So. Uh, I'll write this in JavaScript. So the the HTTP library is not built into Deno. It's it's actually in the standard modules. Um, so you have to import serve. There's a fun function called serve from Deno land, which, by the way, is is just a redirection service to GitHub. If GitHub had prettier URLs, we I would just you know ideally we we could just write GitHub.com you know, ry HTTP server.ts. This would be great. Unfortunately, this doesn't work yet. Yet. So deno land standard HTTP server TS is is where the server's at. Uh, and yeah, basically you, you just do serve and then you can give a port and that will listen on the local host. Maybe we can console log something. Listening on port 1000. So let's see. We've got webserver.js. So the way that you run this thing actually is you do deno run and then the program. Okay, so first thing that happens is it says, Deno requests network access to, to port 8000. Do you want to grant this? Um, so this is this is part of this whole security model, right? It's it, it doesn't allow you to just uh, start serving connections on port 8000. That that would not be a secure sandbox. Um, so you know you can either type always and and like actually grant it access uh, interactively, or you can uh, you know kind of grant allow net kind of like this, right? So, of course, we haven't done anything yet. Um, to, so, yeah, to, to, to actually accept connections, we do this for a wait loop. For a wait, let request of, maybe I'll just put this guy over here. Delete that, delete that. So, console log got a request. Doesn't seem good to you. So when I run that, it says, oh, syntax error, unexpected reserve word. Uh, any any suggestions? We we don't support top level await, unfortunately, or I should say, V8 doesn't support top level await. Uh, what what we need to do is is wrap this thing in 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 a little. This is this is a bit of boilerplate. So basically, I'm just going to put this guy in in this. Oops. Async, right? So, you know, I, I have this bit of boilerplate that I, that I have to write to, to actually do uh, async things. Uh, let's try this again. Okay, of course, listening on port 8000 is is uh, printed before I actually do it. So, if I curl localhost port 8000, I get a request. But I don't get a response because, of course, I haven't sent, sent a response yet. If I cancel that and send another one, I get get another request. Okay, so let's send a response. Respond, and yeah, you, you can give a body, and this this body is is some U in eight array, uh, which I need to define. Const body equals, and well, how do you? What I what I want to do is is just send like the string hello, uh, but you know Deno doesn't do string encoding for you. You you have to you have to it doesn't do text encoding for you. Uh, you, you you have to do this yourself. So that, you know this is meant to be a lower level library that you would have a framework on top of, right? So this is essentially just providing the HTTP parsing. Uh, but the way that you can turn this guy into a uh, UN8 array, oops, into an array buffer is to do, to use the text encoder, right? 
also a browser API. So yeah, we're we're generating a, a U. Uh, is that a UN? I think so. All right. So if we restart it and we curl it, we get now we get uh, hello back, right? So. Yeah, so so this this is an example of of using the standard library and and using uh, URL imports. Um, let's examine this a little bit further. So if I do uh, deno oops, deno info web server, uh, this is going to print out a bunch of information. This this tells me. Uh, some, something about what this script is doing. So, of course, it's, it's local location and what it is, it's TypeScript, but it also gives me this, this dependency tree of, of things that it depends on. HTTP server depends on buffio.ts, which depends on util.ts, right? This is, this is a, a very nice utility to have. Uh, this is this is this is not even something that is uh, limited to deno scripts, right? I mean, if if you're using uh, this uh, ES modules in web browsers, you you can of course uh, use deno info with that as well. Um, so I, I mean, for for example, um, well, let me let me show you a different program. So you don't have to actually have the program downloaded onto your computer uh, or like in the current directory to run it. You can, you can just supply a URL. Um, so, you know, in, in this way, it's, it's kind of like a, a little web browser. So what I'm going to do is, is run a program that uh, serves up the local file system, right? So we'll, we'll serve up this, this local directory as a HTTP server. Uh, and it's called file server dot ts. So I, I'm going to run this. And yeah, of course, this thing is going to give me some permission prompts. Uh-oh, yeah. So it, it wants to listen on, on like, OK. I guess I can allow that. If I open up Chrome here and go to what well, port, go to this URL, it's going to spin for a while. And that's because I got another thing. Oh, it, it wants to have uh, read access. Okay, so this is getting kind of annoying. But now that I've granted that, okay, now 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 it's it's serving up the the local host, right? Um, yeah. It, well, I should mention that you know if if you kind of know the code that you're working with, you can always opt out of all of these permissions with, with this dash A thing, right? And then you don't, don't have any problems with, with the permission prompts. Um, anyway, I brought the, up this program because, well, for one thing, to, to show you that you can kind of just run URLs like this. Um, so this, this kind of makes a very convenient way to, to distribute a command line utility. If somebody has Deno installed and you have your program on a website, there's nothing more that that needs to be installed, right? You you should be able to to kind of uh, easily give people access to command line utilities in this way. Anyway, let's let's look at this this info a little bit. So yeah, this 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 program is is TypeScript, right? And it has this compiled component and a source map component, and of course this big depth tree too. I uh, just kind of wanted to show you this cache folder. So, you know, this, well, let's just look at this file. This is, this is what uh, this URL has, com has uh, been compiled to. So it, this is cached locally on my computer. This is, this is the JavaScript that, I, that actually gets, gets run, right? Um, let's go into this, this cache, this cache folder and just have a peek at what's happening here. So let me CD into that. So there's this is basically where Deno is storing all of its stuff. Um, if I do tree, maybe let's see if that, oh, I don't have tree installed. Damn. Find less. OK. Um, so in, in this gen directory, we have all of these 
very weird looking files. Uh, these, these checksum files, these are, these are all the co compiled uh, TypeScript files and, and their corresponding source maps. And there's quite a lot of them. Uh, in this depths folder, find depths less. Uh, this is where it's caching all of the uh, uh, URLs that, that it downloaded, all the, all the HTTP URLs, right? You can even see that it's, it's cached the, the headers of, of the requests that it made to, to get, say, this, this buff IO thing. Um, yeah. So what else did I want to show you? Showed you that. Oh, yeah. Let me show you this, this new sandboxing feature. So we, we, we actually just landed this uh, a few days ago. Um, so what I'm going to do is run that file server again and just kind of demonstrate that we can restrict read access to only a certain subtree of the file system. So I'll, I'll try to restrict sub, the uh, reading to uh, uh, slash temp, right? So what I'll do is, is cd into slash because this file server serves the, the current directory. And I'm going to go in here and go back to my run command, right? And instead of giving a dash A here, uh, let's do allow net and then allow read slash temp, right? So, so we're only allowing it to read this, this, this subtree. So again, it's, it's serving this at uh, 4,500. So let me load that. And it's spinning. I made a mistake here because it's going to prompt. We want to opt out of these prompts, right? We, we only want to serve this, this, uh, this directory. So there, there's another flag, no prompt, that, that will just, you know, when, whenever it doesn't have access, it will just deny it immediately. So, all right, so now, now we're running. And when I try to load slash, it can't do it, right? This should serve up the root directory. But if I go to slash temp, then it has, it, it, it can actually read, read from slash temp. Um, you know, I, I mean, just to, to prove to you that these are the same things, right? So, so that's, that's what's in slash temp. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> it's like, is that actually the same? Um, but you know, if, if we try to go to slay slash EDC password, you can't do that, right? It's, it's going to deny it. So, so we, we kind of have this, this more fine-grained permission system. And I, I think that, that uh, you know, the, the permission system is, is evolving, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get better over time. Uh, yeah, so let's see here. Yeah, so, oops. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is under development. Uh, it's, it's kind of an ambitious project, and there's, there's kind of a lot of things to figure out. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're trying to be quite careful about it, but I think by the end of the summer or so, we'll, we'll, we'll have a 1.0 version, hopefully. Um, you know, the, one of the main things that's missing is, is debuggability. We, you can't connect Chrome Inspector to it yet. We'll, we'll, we'll fix that. We don't really have very good documentation. We'll get a doc, doc, doc website going, um, which I think will be very compelling, actually. Um, we have some, some performance issues. We can't do uh, uh, SSL, TLS yet. Um, that needs to be fixed. I mentioned import maps for these bare URLs. I think that'll be very nice. We'll, we'll have that done soon. And you know, some, some more of these kind of utility commands, it's like deno test and deno lint. I, I guess I didn't mention, and since I have a minute left, um, you know, let's let's say I want to format this file, right? So let's say I'm a really bad programmer, and I've I've put a bunch of weird spaces in here. Um, so the, right, that's the file that I was editing before. We have this deno format, right, which uh, just runs prettier on it. We, so so. Uh, you know, I, I think the the idea with with all of this is just to just kind of have the the, the whole development experience in in much the same way that that Go provides. Um, so so we'll we'll also have a, a deno test command and a deno lint command. Um, and someday I would really love to do WebGL, but we kind of have to figure out some of these uh, other issues first. 
Um, and yeah, I should say that this is an open collaboration and there's, there's many people who work on it and I would uh, invite you to, to check it out if you're interested. I mean, we, we kind of have everything from very hard Rust uh, internal problems, you know, to working with V8 to, to the standard library is, is written completely in TypeScript. So, you know, I, I think there, no matter your skill level, well, as long as it's somewhat there, is, is it, it would be appropriate to, to kind of contribute to this, you know, if, if you think that such a thing is a good idea. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention and inviting me here. All right, Ryan, thank you. Would you like to join me for a little conversation? Sorry? Would you like to join me for a little conversation? Sure. For a few minutes? Well, we have so many questions coming in, but I have a magic question. Vim, huh? Sorry? Vim, huh? Yes. You're a big fan of Vim? Uh, I wouldn't, s no, I wouldn't say that. It's just what I use and okay. what I've always used. But okay. yeah, it's, it's hard to switch when you're old. Well, come on, you're not that old. Yeah, there are people who are older than you. Uh, I was just saying. Um, we have many, many questions coming in, so I'm just going to jump in. There are like 25 or so. So I think you'll be available to the audience later in sure. the discussion zones and all. Um, Alexei is wondering, so does Deno support plugins like Webpack does? Uh, I mean, you can import uh, URLs, and this is, this is the only sort of plugin that, that we support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about the cache size of Denim modules? Could it be a problem like Node modules? Um, so, I mean, l less things get downloaded, right? When you when you install something from npm, it ends up installing like all these different files, uh, readmes and com bundled artifacts that you might not be using. Uh, so, in 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 this thing, it's it's really just downloading what it needs to to download. So, it it should be more efficient in in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vladimir is wondering: Can a Deno library author unpublish the package? Sorry. Can a Deno library author unpublish the package? Um, yes. So it's just URLs. So uh, so you know if if uh, <laughs> so I mean so we, we, we have this this Deno land thing up yeah. there where where you, we we're trying to make it easy to to kind of. Do this, but my hope would be that somebody else kind of goes and makes a, a proper package repository for this stuff, where right. they might support the feature of unpublishing. But I mean, ultimately, from Deno's point of view, it's just URLs, and it doesn't try to make any anything beyond what the browser does exactly. Mm, okay. So hopefully, somebody will will make something where you know you can trust that. Right. Somebody won't unpublish or won't change stuff after the fact. So it's interesting because if I look at the state of things right now and I compare with how things used to be, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, it seems like the evolution of JavaScript, the evolution of front end is it's moving so fast. It's really hard to keep up. Um, so I'm wondering at this point, of all the technologies and things that are actually out there, like, you know, we have conversations about WebAssembly, we have conversations about Jamstack, have conversations about you know, Rust. Um, what are you most excited about these days when you look at front end? I mean, I know that this is a project you're working on specifically now, but what are you kind of looking forward to for the next, I don't know, few years or so? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, you, you basically mentioned all of them. Like, I, I think WebAssembly is really great. Uh, is, you know, going, going to be very useful for those certain uh, very, uh, Hot bits of code that that you might need to 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 execute, um, so that that's exciting, and I think Rust plays really well into that equation. I, Rust I mentioned is is uh, a really uh, interesting and and good language. I would encourage everybody to check that out. Although that's a bit beyond uh, front end development, but you know with WebAssembly, uh, I I think it starts you know coming closer to to that too. Right. Um, I have a feeling maybe I'm wrong. I have a feeling that you spent quite a bit of time in JavaScript. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. So, me, uh, maybe, maybe less time than you would think, actually. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, but if you look again in the future now of JavaScript specifically, is there something that you're desperately missing in JavaScript that has to be done, that has to be improved? I mean, top level await is, is definitely super annoying. Um, 
I, I think there's there's many little cleanups like this uh, import maps sort of thing that that you know kind of need need to be done and you know TC39 is is kind of full of full of these sort of issues that are uh, you know trying trying to make the language better. I mean, it, to be honest, I think the syntax is is quite crufty, and I think you know. Maybe maybe it's time to like reevaluate a a kind of new skin on top of on top of JavaScript, but uh, slash TypeScript. Um, but yeah, that's not something I would do. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in general, it's it's a very nice language because it's just so ubiquitous and runs in web browsers. You know, the the actual language itself, yeah, it's it's good enough. Okay, so the future looks bright. Uh, I, I don't think JavaScript is going anywhere. Okay, excellent. That's pretty reassuring for all of us, I think. Okay, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks. Well done. Thank you, sir.